I'm Reed Sreary, R-E-E-D-S-R-E-R-E. -E -E. I'm recording this oral history for the Atomic Heritage Foundation on June 3rd in Washington, D.C. Please state your name yeah. and stuff. Hi, I'm David Fox. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, my father was a physicist uh, on the Manhattan Project in Manhattan. Uh, and so that's why I'm here. Please um, tell us your place and date of birth. Mine? Yes. <laughs> um, I was born in New York City, uh, December 26, 1935. Well, this is really just a chance for you to talk, so please tell us about your father. Okay. Um, well, uh, during World War II, I doubled in age from 5 to 10. And so uh, I have some very vague early recollections. I, one of my earliest memories is Pearl Harbor, uh, when I was not, not quite uh, I was five years old. Uh, but the thing that I, I remember most is that after the war started, my father was approached by the, uh, by the Army, by the Army Air Corps. My father at the time was 31 years old. He had been a physicist at Columbia. There were no jobs for a physicist, so he actually left science in the late 1930s uh, and was managing a shoe factory in Hanover, Pennsylvania. Interesting. But uh, Columbia, his uh, thesis advisor uh, was uh, Zimmer Rabi, Nobel Prize winner, and also uh, Harold Urey, Nobel Prize winners. And they were uh, sort of the unofficial recruiters uh, of scientists during the war. And so they approached my father as one of the young scientists. And uh, the government gave him really two, two alternatives. One is that uh, he could join the Army Air Corps as a captain and go to MIT and work on what was then the secret of the early war, which was radar. Uh, the other alternative is that he could stay a civilian and go to MIT and work on radar. <laughs> <laughs> Those were his choices. Uh, being basically a, a pacifist-minded person, he chose the latter. And so he moved in uh, his family, the, uh, myself and my sister Nancy, uh, and my mother William, and we moved from Pennsylvania to Brookline, Massachusetts. And of course he worked on it secret project, which is very embarrassing for me as, as his son, because when the war got started, all my friends' fathers were in uniform, they had pictures on the mantle, uh, they were overseas. My father was a bum. He came home every night to dinner. He had no job that I knew of. Uh, it, was, it was a very strange situation. You know, all these other men were defending the country, and my father was doing nothing. Uh, of course, then the secret of Braveheart came out, and by that time he had been recruited again for the Manhattan Project. So he continued to work on secret stuff even after I learned about Braveheart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was that was how it was one way that uh, scientists were recruited at that time, and of course there ended up being thousands of them. He did not work in Los Alamos. We were, uh, he worked in Manhattan. Not sure which address he worked at, but of course, again, Columbia was sort of the nexus of uh, the Manhattan part of it, and also in the recruiting for the other locations. So that's how it, how it began. Uh, and all during the war, actually, one of my early memories was I was away at camp in 1945, and uh, I got a letter from him in July 45 saying, if uh, if you Watch the newspapers, and the next few weeks you'll learn what I've been doing. This is a rare thing for me to, <coughs> to get a letter. And sure enough, when the bomb was dropped, and it was in newspapers <coughs> everywhere, I learned that that's what he had been doing. And so uh, I was kind of a little celebrity in, <laughs> in camp. Uh, but it was really, it was really good for me because once the secrecy was lifted or largely lifted can to, uh, to open up to me, and uh, I learned of 
both the science and the politics of the post-war era, which was a very difficult time for him uh, because he was one of the scientists that tried to advocate not bombing Japan and later on uh, international control of the bomb. Uh, and of course he worshipped Oppenheimer uh, and uh, he was in total despair when Oppenheimer was uh, uh, persecuted, hated Teller. Uh, and uh, it was just a very disillusioning time for him. Did your family suffer much during the, the whole Red Scare? No, he was, in that sense, he was clean. But I do remember that he had two friends who committed suicide. Their wow. lives had been ruined. Uh, but I, I, I don't have much of a recollection of that. Uh, so we were spared. And, and as soon as the war was over, he was one of the early uh, employees of Brookhaven National Lab, which was the first lab that was not controlled by the military. Uh, and so uh, he got to his, his wish to, uh, to pursue peacetime uh, applications of, of, the, of the technology. Uh, he was always an idealist about technology, like he thought radar would control cars and airplanes and prevent accidents. <laughs> you know, he, he thought radar was great, and then when atomic energy came along, he said, that's going to solve the energy problems, uh, the uh, burning fossil fuel problems. It's going to solve uh, sources of water. He thought it, it, uh, they would, there would be plants that would desalinate water using just nuclear energy. Uh, he was just always fascinated by the upsides of these these things. Uh, it'd be interesting to, <laughs> to wonder what he would think today. He died 50 years ago oh. this year, 1965. So he never, <laughs> <laughs> never well, got to see the negative sides of these. Much things. has changed. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he was very much an idealist about that. And he, he liked all kinds of things. Like when the, when the turnpikes opened and, and, uh, and clover leaves came in, he ah. thought that was a fantastic <laughs> clover leaves, and I remember when diner's card came in and it was going to replace cash. <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that he was enthusiastic about. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, but then the, the the bulk of his career really was after that at Brookhaven. Uh, he, he became the head of the uh, reactor department at Brookhaven, first peacetime reactor, and uh, they were just loaded with stories. But this time I got to be teenager, so I, I could give tours of the reactor and things like that. That's what I used to do. So I, there are lots of anecdotes. I, I remember one, for example, at one point the largest accelerator in the world was in Brookhaven. It was called the Cosmotron, and it had these huge magnets. And I think it was about either half a kilometer or a kilometer in diameter sort of underground, um, and he said that when they turned on the magnets, the Long Island Lighting Company, the company that did all of Eastern Long Island, its, it's, it's load doubled. <laughs> so that that one machine <laughs> equaled all the households and everything. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but he used to say that. Uh, and then, so somebody had the idea that maybe they use the electricity and regenerate electricity back to the Long Island Lighting Company. And so they came up with the idea of a flywheel. This flywheel was 27 feet in diameter, and four or five feet thick, a boron steel, very heavy. And it would, it would start to go around while the, while the uh, Cosmotron was working. And then when the Cosmotron was shut off, it could keep going for about four hours after it was generating electricity back to the utility. So this was a great idea and it worked well. But then somebody asked the question of safety. Now when I used to give tours of the lab, one of the things I would do is that, that flywheel when it was going, there were these bushings that, you know, where the, the axis was. You could take a nickel on its edge, put it right on the bushing and it wouldn't tip over. That's how little vibration it was, you know. And so it was very well designed. But somebody said, suppose something happened. What would happen? So the, the, 
they looked at him, they said, well, thank God, he would go straight out the side of the building, <laughs> not where people were. Okay. So that was the first level of analysis, and he was going to go straight out the side of the building. And then somebody else said, yeah, but where else? It turned out it would go straight towards New York City at 250 miles an hour. <laughs> that was an expressive right? <laughs> so, so that was a scary thing. But then the third level of analysis was that Long Island is, is, is sandy. It's, it's a sandy, it's like a sandbar. So it would bury itself. The sand couldn't support it. So they felt the same thing after all. But I remember those three levels of analysis. <laughs> there were never any accidents at the. No, not at that time, no. How your father felt after he worked on the project about his work on the project? He felt it, 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 it ended the war. I mean, I don't think there was any issue of that. He, he joined what was called the United World Federalists at the time. Their idea was that the, that the bomb should be controlled internationally. It was a much stronger idea than the United Nations. I think it started around 1947. Uh, they, they wanted to use as a model how the 13 colonies got together to create the United States. Because basically what the 13 colonies did is they ceded some of their sovereignty. They wouldn't have separate currency or separate armies or duties at the borders and things like that. So some of the state sovereignty was now ceded for mutual benefit to the nation. The United World Federalism advocated the same thing on an international basis that each individual nation should cede some of its authority to an enforceable central authority. And of course, it never went anywhere. But that, was, that sort of illustrated his uh, idealism uh, at the time. And both he and my mother worked very hard about that. They felt that, uh, that the bomb just had to be controlled internationally. It couldn't be the kind of thing that would pit one nation against another. Basically, they felt the same way as Oppenheimer and others did, which is, especially when it got to the hydrogen bomb, there is no target on Earth that justifies it. They didn't even think the atomic bomb had a, had a target on Earth that justified it. Too many civilians. There's no way to make it be a military thing. So there was a lot of disillusion politically because obviously all those ideas went nowhere. And the Cold War set in instead. From my point of view, as the sort of the eldest son, it was a great way of growing up among science and politics. I ended up becoming a mathematician, uh, but uh, you know, lifelong love of science and all came from that, that period, say, you know, the 10 or 20 years after the war. It does sound like your father really exposed you to his work after the war. How was it growing up with that? Yeah, it was great. Because I, I, I love the science. He, he, he subscribed, for example, to the Bullet of the Atomic Scientists and, and Scientific American and other. And he would always bring the math problems home to me. And so I, I, uh, I chewed on the math problems. And I, I had great fun with that. And one, once or twice, I would, I would outperform some of his physicist <laughs> friends. And so he would brag about his 14 year old and solve this or solve that. You know. His. He had a hierarchy in, in, in science. And the mathematicians and theoretical physicists were at the top, and then the experimenters were next, and then maybe the chemists, and then the biologists, and then finally engineers and technicians. And there was like a hierarchy, you know, with Einstein at the very top, you know. But he, he was an experimenter, so he always felt, he made me feel like I could be one level above him, uh, which was true. Did not have the math that I ended up with. Um, so that was sort of the hierarchy that was the background for my upbringing. Uh, I thought I was going to be a physicist. In fact, I, I, I actually enrolled in Columbia, but I, I hated it. <laughs> and so he helped me get into math, and I got my degree at NYU instead, which has a core on institute. He 
was a, he was a tough father, but at the same time, he gave you he gave me uh, the assurance that I can that I can do all these difficult things and, and be at that what he regarded as the top level. Uh, I remember we once made a trip to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. Oppenheimer didn't have to be there at that time; he was in Washington. But we we I, I got to shake hands with Einstein. Ever since I joked that I never washed that hand again, you know. Uh, I guess I must have been about 16 or so, something like that. So, you know, I, I, uh, I was exposed to things that most kids don't know about. I remember we, we grew up in a small town near Brookhaven called Belport, and there was a very, quote, haunted house. You know, I run down X mansion, but of course our kids were not supposed to go near because it was dangerous and all that kind of stuff. And there was the doors were half off, and there was growth of all kinds. So of course that's where we went. And I would, I remember going upstairs one day with my friends, and there was stacks and stacks of newspapers in this in this old, uh, you know. And sure enough, the top newspaper. Mentioned Ernst Rutherford, Ernest Rutherford, and of course I knew who you know, my friends knew. <laughs> I knew who he was, so I brought it home, and it turned out it was a headline in the New York Times in 1938, debunking the idea that atomic energy would ever happen. <laughs> and so <laughs> I brought that home, and my father brought it to the laboratory and said, "My son found this. You know, it was a big." Historic artifact, uh, and I've since looked it up. And sure enough, it's, it was a headline. It, it, it called the idea of getting uh, energy out of the atom moonshine. <laughs> That's what Rutherford said. <laughs> so, Incredible. Those are the kinds of things that I was exposed to. But if I hadn't been exposed to it by my father, I wouldn't. Have, it would have been just a pile of newspapers, right? Okay. Do you know if your father ever talked to your mother about his work? Or was it? Completely? He admitted after the war that he had sometimes, uh, and uh, that he'd broken the rules. Uh, actually, there was an earlier incident. <laughs> when they were first married, I guess, I think they were married in 1934 or 35, and uh, his first assignment was for Yuri, who had invented the first mass spectrometer. That means anything to you, but anyway, uh, it was an elaborate device, and uh, I, I don't know if it was part of what got Yuri the Nobel Prize. I'm not really sure, but the point is, it was it was a big thing, and it was one of a kind. And so his first assignment as an assistant or whatever he was uh, was to build. Or no, I know what it was. They had built a second one, and this time they had funding. Whereas the first one had no funding, and the second one didn't work. So his assignment was to figure out what went wrong, compare the two, and fix the second one. And uh, there was no documentation, it was just lab notes. So there were piles and piles of lab notes. Uh, uh, and it looked to him like everything was fine. But one day, he gets home, and the lab notes are gone. The only lab notes. Somehow, Was furious at my mother. It was a terrible way to start the marriage, <laughs> you know. But they were never found. So now, and he couldn't admit it to Yuri or to Robbie, so he didn't know what the hell to do. But he was a he was a born tinkerer, so he just took the second one apart, screw by screw, you know, comparing it. And he said the only real difference you could see is when they when they got some money to build the second one, they put gold leaf around. So it looked nice. So when he put it back together, he left the gold leaf and all this fancy stuff off, and it worked perfectly. <laughs> so they later figured out that there was some interference going on because of the gold leaf, and that's, that's what had caused the problem. <laughs> but so he, he lucked out. But it was, that was a real problem for, for marriage, I'm sure. <laughs> Have 
any more anecdotes from your father's either time during the Manhattan Project or on radar or after the war? Ah, let's see. I'll tell you, not, I'll tell you what about security. Okay. While Brookhaven was a was run by associated universities and not by the military, it did have military uh, security. And his first secretary, my father's first secretary, uh, was very competent, but her clearance never came through. And he had that top clearance, which was Q clearance at the time. Never came through, never came through. And they couldn't figure out why. Clearance was really strange. He, he always mocked clearance. He said, he said, for example, when they were trying to clear him, they interviewed his elderly parents in Ohio about his character. What they were going to find out from his own parents couldn't figure out. <laughs> anyway, his clearance was fine. Anyway, one day, the secretary comes in his office, shuts the door, sits down opposite him, and bursts into tears, just uncontrollable, uh, weeping. When she finally blurts out, they found out that I lied on my security. I'm sure we can straighten that out, you know, because by this time she's been great secretary for a year. Let's straighten it out. What, what did you know? What did you lie about? She says everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, it turned out that when she applied for the job, she had had no professional experience, so she made up a background of professional experience. Because she had all the skills and she knew she could do it, she was very bright. All that. <laughs> it did get straightened out, but when she blurted out everything, he said, "Oh my!" God. <laughs> uh, so that was one incident I remember. Um, I don't know. The other thing I, I, I remember is he offered me the chance to go up. They, the Brookhaven stacks where the, where the uh, exhaust air came out. Was at a certain level, I don't know how many hundreds of feet. But the air that comes out uh, is invisible. It's not like smoke. So they also built a parallel tower, just like a, like a steel structure that went out even higher and had a pipe that went up to the same level as the stack. And that would really smoke so that they could tell which direction <laughs> I remember it was a winter day. It was cold. It was, it, was, it was this structure, you know. But I don't think he ever went up either, <laughs> you know. Um, anyway. But he, you know, he was an athlete. He, uh, he was sort of the player manager of their softball team. His ambition was to be on the Atomic Energy Commission, but that never happened. He actually ended up being uh, appointed to the Italian Atomic Energy Commission. Interesting. And uh, what I remember about that is that he couldn't stand the Italian <laughs> inefficiency. He said, you know, they'd lose electricity in their apartment, there would be no word of whether you're going to get it back in 10 minutes or 10 days or 10 months. <laughs> it was like, it was no, no information at all. And the other thing is, mind you, this is probably late 50s, early 60s, you know, maybe 10, 15 years after the war. My father was Jewish. He, he, want, he, was, he, had, he wanted to leave Brookhaven. His parents got divorced. It was a very bitter time. So I think he, he just wanted to get out. I don't know. I don't know how it happened. 
I know that he really wanted to be on the Atomic Energy Commission. He felt that he, that he had the, the wisdom and the knowledge to do it. Uh, but I don't think that was ever seriously considered. The problem is that during the war, A, I was too young, and, and B, uh, he didn't really, he wasn't the kind of guy that talked about his own contributions much. Like when he, when he ran the department at Brookhaven, I always heard stories about the younger scientists that sort of he was in charge of. He was so proud of them uh, that I really don't know what his scientific achievements were. Uh, and as I say, he sort of put himself down as just an experimenter. Um, so I, I don't know. I'd love to know even which of the sites in Manhattan Younger scientists loved him. I know that because I, I remember it. since they were close to my age, you know, chatting with them all the time. He, he really liked to nurture their careers and he bragged about that. I know one of the things that uh, that he did take credit for was designing the Brookhaven pile, uh, putting the control rods through the corners. Uh, I don't know if it was his idea, but somehow he, he was instrumental. The idea of that was that then they could have more experimental holes in the sides because the, the corners would be for, you know, for the rod, control rods and then they could have all these positions on the sides that were available for experimenting. I know you really like that. I also remember when I, when I was giving tours, I could, you could walk on top of the reactor and there was one particular block of graphite which uh, had once been moved to put a human person's head directly exposed to the neutrons. This was somebody who was going to die in a matter of hours and they were, they, you know, they, they were seeing what the effect on a, a massive tumor and, they, and they, he apparently lived for a couple of extra days. So they, they felt that they had learned something from this poor guy, whoever it was. So I could point out exactly where a human head is. Suppose you know that that kind of thing. Uh, How much of the laboratory did you show when you were giving these tours? Um, actually, my, by that time, this was in the fifties. It was it was pretty open. I mean, already uh, there was starting a second reactor for medical. Uh, you know, it was a peacetime. So it, it really wasn't, wasn't that much of a problem. I remember that uh, one of the things I did very early on was just randomly take things, both uh, animal, vegetable, and mineral, and expose it to radiation, and just to see what radiation did to things. And he had a contact with Harry Winston, the jeweler in New York, Winston Jeweler. And they decided to expose diamonds to radiation. And so what they did is they had a, a series of diamonds. And they picked for diamonds, diamonds that were flawless, but whose color was not great. It was a little bit yellowish. And apparently those are the least valuable diamonds they used industrially because nobody likes the color. And they'd expose it to a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then compare them. And they had this, this whole sequence of diamonds. Well, when they came out of the radiation, just green. And everything from a, a, a very white green to almost an onyx dark black rock green. And Harry Winston immediately got scared because apparently the rarest diamonds on earth are green diamonds. And so they were just collector's items and now you can produce one in the reactor. So it, it would upset the whole business, you know. And uh, so they put an end to that experiment. <laughs> and I wish I still had those diamonds, uh, but uh, I don't know what happened to them. But they were gorgeous, lined up like that. And of course, after that happened, then they realized that the reason the green diamonds are so scarce in nature is that they were only sources of diamonds that happened to be near uranium, you know, by accident. <laughs> but I remember he said they Goats underneath, and, uh, just everything you can imagine. 
<laughs> that's how random the experimentation <laughs> was uh, in the beginning. <laughs> but he loved it. Just the whole idea of, of uh, using the radiation for pure intellectual joy. Uh, was, that was his stock and trade. That's fantastic. Yeah. Do you have any, any last stories or memories <laughs> you want to share? Uh, no, I, I would say, I think, I think his career Overall, it had kind of an arc. You know, he was younger, enthusiastic, and everything. And then during the war, that was it was a fantastic opportunity, both radar and the Manhattan Project. And then Brookhaven was sort of the, the peak because now he could nurture you know, dozens of other scientists and work on peacetime things, which he loved. Uh, but then I think with the divorce and not getting the position in the Atomic Energy Commission, I think disillusion really set in. And he actually died quite young. Uh, he was 55 when he died. Uh, he died of a sudden heart attack. So he never really had a chance after that. So it's, it's a curve like that. Uh, and as I say, he was a tough father on me, but I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to at least recall uh, some of those. I always like the story of how he was recruited and things like that. I'm sure there are other methods that people were recruited just listening to this conference and how many came from the military and stuff like that. But he was this 31 year old who was remembered at Columbia <laughs> and said, you know, here's your choice. <laughs> but you're moving you're moving to Boston. <laughs>